Welcome to Wife Wants a Wizard. I am not a wizard, but I'm working on it. I spent more time than anyone else watching the Hogwarts Legacy Sony State of Play reveal trailer. I spent more time looking at this than even the people making the game, as evidenced by the fact that I noticed this building has no walls, and they did not. So in this video, I'm going to show you all the things that I noticed in the Hogwarts Legacy reveal that you did not. If you did notice some of this stuff, bully for you. Feel free to brag about it in the comments section below. And if you noticed all of this stuff, do not comment in the comment section below because nobody likes a braggart. Also, why didn't you make this video? Do you have any idea how long this thing took me? Days. I've been at this for days. And before you ask, no, I will not tell you what my house is because I know how you people are. Just because a person talks to snakes and we had that one jerk in the 1990s does not mean that a house should be shamed forever. Nor will I tell you my wife's house. In fact, I'm not even going to tell you her name. For the rest of this video, we will simply refer to her as Wifel Puff. This is a shame-free zone, and shame on you if you shame. Anyway, right up front, I'm issuing a spoiler alert. If you haven't seen the real trailer, do not watch this video, as it will destroy your world. Not only have I seen things you probably haven't, which is why you should be watching this video, I believe I have pieced together major plot points that you haven't, which I will save until the end and warn you about before we get to them. This video will be divided into two parts. Part B will be why putting children into dungeons and calling it a dormitory is why everything that happens in Harry Potter is Hogwarts' fault. And Part A, things I've discovered about Hogwarts Legacy by watching the reveal trailer literally frame by frame until I was no longer a normal human being. You'll find the link to the original Sony release video in the description below. It's the one I used, so any timestamps I refer to are unique to that post. Uh, that way you can have it open in another window, jump around to the timestamps to verify my claims, and then come back. To begin, I read on the interwebs that all YouTube videos should start off with the most exciting stuff to maximize the number of people who click the upvote button and subscribe. So we'll begin in the obvious place, the PlayStation controller schema. Now obviously we get precious little from Sony about what the controls or interface look like, but there are some clues. For instance, theory. I believe that there is an invisible reticule dead center in the screen that is essential for operating the target selection mechanic. Throughout the video that they posted, you will see a halo effect around enemies who are being targeted. This is the cleanest example of the halo that I could find. The first halo that we see is on the sliding floor puzzle part of the Ranrock pipe area. In this moment, when Natsai and I gets absolutely obliterated in a way that I will refuse to stop reminding her about for the rest of the time that she's willing to stand by my side, you can see that when the main character casts this AoE blast, you can see there is no halo. This makes me think that there are two sets of controls. Pulling the left trigger switches you over to the single target spells. Here where the target actually switches presumably when you release and pull the trigger again rapidly. And here in the darkness, which really shows the halo effect. Evidence of this is in the shot at 652. When you yank this barrel, the other guy is targeted. The player switches targets while the barrel is in the air. Then you blow them both up. Another piece of proof of this theory is that when the character is turned away from the target at 716, he still halos a target essentially behind him. Now, let's talk for a minute about the spell that isn't Apparate. Apparate is when you take Dumbledore's sleeve and you go somewhere instantly. This is an unnamed spell that was created for the movies. You can see it here during the fight at the Ministry right before Sirius Black dies. This is another look at it when the Order saves Luna Lovegood. Now the question I have to ask is, how did the game know where to land? Notice that the target changes a split second before casting, meaning we can cast the spell that isn't Apparate toward a target, not just forward. This path is curved though, meaning we must be able to strafe while not Apparating. Side note, the spell that was never named was cast mid-roll, canceling the roll animation. Thus we can cancel animations, which is great for fast combat. Here at 727, even though you blew up the other guy, this guy gets thrown from the explosion. Targeting remains unaffected by the explosion, and before he hits the ground, you yank him back to you while he's still in midair. Now this is 745. This one is really interesting to me. After this hooded wizard rides the lightning, the target switches to the campfire, meaning you can cast magic on campfires or possibly pull flaming logs out. I'm hoping that this is similar to the game Thief, in that you can use a stealth mechanic where you douse the flames by using the spell Nox. Finally at 807, notice how the target switches while the previous Descendo spell is still going, meaning you don't have to wait for the first spell to end before casting the second, which makes sense given what they said about spell combos. Now the thing we know for sure is that R1 grabs many things using Dark Vader magic. 
Here at 633, R1 grabs a rock. Here at 723, you get your first fire barrel. Here at 805, a second fire barrel. This means that you can pick up something with RB and target with the left trigger at the same time and then bonk whoever you just targeted with the object. That leads me to the single most exciting thing that they didn't confirm, but I believe I'll be allowed to do it will. At 736, you can target a goblin. Now this is where we see the main character doing a finishing move. So R1 might be a requirement either for finishers or just this particular triple dribble finisher. So I believe, though this is speculation, that you will be able to hit people with other people. And that is an obnoxious level of awesome. Other things you can throw, 657 is a box, 742 is a broken column, 830 is a plain barrel, 835 is an unknown item in the background, 838 is the same room, but in the other corner you still can't see it, uh, 706, tough to tell in this shot, but later you can clearly see that this is some sort of small personal space heater, and at 643, literally darkness, I don't know, it could be anything. So how do you know what you can interact with? Well, did you notice the white diamonds? Here at 633, a diamond appears in midair above an unconscious body. As the MC moves, you can see it stays with the body and not any of the conscious enemies. The white diamonds mean interactable, which changes depending on the situation. I found a total of six, although there were some flickers that weren't of interest to what we're doing here. Uh, the other five are at 846, white diamonds become collect during pickable mushroom events. Uh, at 11.33, white diamond in the room of requirement as you approach the table, uh, but aren't quite close enough to interact with it. Uh, better view of that here at 11.34. 12.25, interactable behind the Hogsmeade browser uh, in this shot. 13.22, the Boostgar running the minigame has a white diamond above his head. And at 7.32, there is a single frame where you can see the white diamond appear about where this guy's head is prior to the second strike meaning he's unconscious and lootable at that point, but you're not done embarrassing his corpse, so he just switches back almost instantly. And finally, we know that Square on the PlayStation will be the universal action button. I will refer to this as the UAB. Uh, 833, even though we see an actual spell, which is Petrificus Totalis, attached to the Square button, uh, the rest of the time it's the UAB. Uh, I'm worried about this a little bit because what if you're in the middle of battle and you accidentally target someone who is, you know, an interactable, like an unconscious body or something like that, uh, that could cost you some time and or your life. At 835, the square button is interact uh, while you are getting mooned by this other guy. Uh, 838, loot is also square and loot is different from interact, which I think is worth noting. 846, again, during this mushroom shot, the white diamond becomes collect. Uh, it's the use button here. It's the collect button in the room of requirement here and also here. Uh, no label on this square, so I'm guessing it's going to say eventually mount or maybe pet. Uh, pick up this potion. You can interact with these shopkeepers. And finally, you get to pet and or feed and or mount this baby Thestral. There is one exception, however. I don't know if you noticed this, but at 9.06, for whatever reason, the Add to Potion button is an X, not a square. So that's all that we get about the interface. It's something that many of the reaction video YouTubers talked about because key bindings are important to fluid combat, so we're all looking forward to seeing how the thing plays. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see. That's it for the controls. Now I want to run through a handful of really quick things that help explain some of the other stuff that I'm going to bring up in the video. First up is the newspaper. At about the five minute mark, some guy whips out a copy of the Daily Prophet. At 5.02, uh, you can see that the article in the back reads, Bothersome Beasties? What has gotten into them? Question uh, mark. Right above an ad for a product named Zodiac. And then one second later, you get the front cover. And if you notice, the date is Monday, September the 1st, 1890, which should be the first day of the game. Uh, you also get the issue number in Chinese for whatever reason, and you get the weather report, which is cloudy and cool tonight and tomorrow. Cold in the afternoon, positively take care to have your owls sent out. Uh, September 1st, 1890 is important for multiple reasons, most of which will come up later in this video. However, it's important to know that in Harry Potter lore, the first day of school of the school year at Hogwarts is September the 1st. In addition to that, I also want to talk about the logo. Um, if you notice, in the middle of the logo here, there's a swoosh. That's very important. It's not just a graphic element. It is going to be one of the most important symbols that you have in the game, and I'm going to prove it to you. As far as this video is concerned, it appears four times. 
The most obvious one is at the very beginning, when the main character puts his hand on the logo at Gringotts and activates whatever portal this is. At 716, you'll spot the logo surrounding this knight statue. Uh, from this particular odd angle, it's not really clear that that's what it is, but I believe that if you were to go to the other side of the statue, that's what you would see. Here at 1410, you'll spot this logo on this door if you look really, really, really closely at it as the character is getting closer. And then at 1414, you'll spot a similar swoosh. I can't swear that it's exactly the same, but it's the smoke here on the table. Also, you might want to notice that there is an egg here. Those sick bastards literally put a Easter egg in their trailer. Other things to look out for in the game will be collectibles. There aren't many, but they are interesting. Most notably is the chests. Uh, here at 348, you see a chest on the ground behind the knocker puzzle. Uh, here at 539, there is a chest behind Ranrock and we will refer to as Minecraft Homes. At 721, chests are tucked into the corners back by this shrine. At 842, the one chest that we actually see open by the player happens. Here at 1112, we see at least one chest in the room of requirement. And then it turns out that Revealo gives us three more chests. One here and two here and here. Throughout the world, you'll spot floating books. Uh, at 1116, you'll find one in the room of requirement. And then at 1228, if you look to the right, the books on the shelf literally start reorganizing themselves just before the cut. There are also floating candles. I don't think they're going to be collectible per se, but I thought they were interesting. Obviously in the main dining hall where they always are, but then also in the room of requirement here on the right. I talked a lot about the beasts. I'm not going to get into them, but uh, here at 1339, the rescued moon calves are taken to this spot, which is in visual distance of Hogwarts, which you can see in the background. And for the six of you who didn't go, what? Thestrals? Why can we see Thestrals? At 1345, these are Thestrals. We don't know why we can see them, because Thestrals can only be seen after you've seen death, according to Looney Lovegood, who, in all fairness, is insane. However, there's also this developer doodle in the after video that I think helps make the point. And then finally, I am almost positive that cups of tea are going to be a collectible in this game. At 2 minutes and 8 seconds, you can see right here in Hufflepuff, just like everywhere else in Hogwarts, because, you know, Britain is a cup of tea. There's also two cups here at 8.16. That child is holding a cup of tea at 327. Oddly, there is not one cup of tea here at 145. Instead, they all appear to have wine goblets. At 0402, there's a cup of tea on the teacher's desk. And then there's this shot in the Gryffindor common room at 205. And all I can say about that is you, sir, have a problem. Similar to collectibles are these fast travel nodes. Uh, my witch and I have agreed that these are the fast travel nodes that you find in all good open world games. Uh, this is the most important one. You find it on some sort of farm or possibly the groundskeeper's hut. There isn't enough information about that. Great view of the plaque, specifically the word Wildsmith. That refers to Ignacia Wildsmith, uh, who we know from Harry Potter lore. She was the inventor of flu powder. You might remember the positively hysterical Diagon Alley moment where Harry says Diagon Alley and goes to the Diagon Alley shop on Diagon Alley. Which, if you think about it, if the guy didn't want a bunch of kids with speech impediments invading his shop, you should change his name. There are four more for a total of five. Chronologically speaking, the first one is here at 219, which we see inside the greenhouse. 428, uh, there's this ball pull mini game, and there's one right there on the left. There's this one, which we will call the clock tower for now, and there's this one by the gatehouse. Other videos have incorrectly identified this as a sixth node. It actually is the reverse of the one at the gatehouse in 1020. Now we're going to get into the heart of this video, life at Hogwarts and what you might not have noticed about it. First up, companions. Several of the companions appear in the video in odd places that you might not have noticed. The first one is the Gryffindor companion, not Sai Uh You see her at start with the troll. Uh, first time we meet her in Charms class, obviously, is where everybody's introduced to her. This is the reverse shot with the wallpaper behind her. She's also there for the ball pull mini game, along with the Charms professor. This is where she gets obliterated by a bunch of dark wizards. Here at 558 at Hogsmeade, when you overhear the bad guy and the other bad guy doing bad guy stuff, she's there with you. 910 here in Potions class, she's in the background. 1020, she's the one with you when you're leaving the Hogwarts portcullis. And 1031, she's the one who closes the door in your face. You know, they show later that there's a spell that lets you move forward quickly in a blaze of white smoke. I want that spell at this moment to see if it'll work. Also, why didn't she just hold the door? And then as a final note, I'd like to mention that she was also in the announce trailer. You can see her here. Next up is the Hufflepuff companion, Poppy Sweeting. Here at the 55 second mark, she's with you and some centaurs. 
Here at the one minute and two second mark, she's with you and a dragon. Uh, back with the centaurs a little bit later on. And of course, she's the one who finds the little birdies in the nest. And she also was in the announced trailer as well, although she had a slightly different look then. Then there's the Slytherin companion, Sebastian Sallow. Uh, he's the one who duels you at the very beginning at 250. And he's had zero character progression at 810 when he's now dueling what we will refer to henceforth as Discount Weasley. There are two other possible times when he's with you. However, I can't confirm them because the it just can't really tell who it is. You just know that it's a Slytherin of some kind. Here at 1012, he's with you combating two students in the clock tower. And here at 514, he is the possible companion in Ragnarok's underground pipe room. Speaking of Discount Weasleys, uh, we see Discount Weasley on three separate occasions. First of all, he is in the Best Buy webpage promotions image. He also appears at 210 mark in the Gryffindor common room and at the 810 mark, Dueling Sebastian. Now, related to the characters is my all-consuming obsession with the robes in the game. Mostly because I'm not sure if they're inconsistent or if they have some sort of deeper meaning that is really driving me nuts. But I both love and hate the robes. At 038, we see that our main character is the only one that has the exclusive gold trim on their robes. Which makes me nervous, but we'll skip that. Here on this image from the Best Buy webpage, we see Discount Weasley and another student. One of them has sleeves with stripes and the other one does not. This makes me think that there could be a possible ranking system, like maybe the prefects have certain stripes or students with special permissions have special stripes. Uh, not entirely sure if there's any even like lore about that, because if I remember correctly, only in like the first two movies do people wear robes. And then after that, it's every man for himself. Now, this image at 1035 is a really good close up look at poppy sweeting sleeves. Um, so you can see what I'm talking about with the stripes and the not stripes. The player has two gold stripes with a large field, whereas everybody else either has three solid stripes or no stripes whatsoever. Here at 2.11 in the actual video, Discount Weasley is wearing a robe with zero stripes altogether. So now we already have a little bit of uh, confusion as to whether these are dress robes, not dress robes, what's going on. During the first dueling scene here at 2.50, all students except the main character have three black sleeves. Which makes me think there might be like dueling robes versus everyday robes versus dress robes. Who knows what's going on? 321, there are dress robes and potions class. You can see three stripes on everybody's sleeves again. 402, however, you see black sleeves. Three minutes, 27 seconds, we have people in Quidditch robes. This is the only real time where we see Quidditch robes. Um, and then again here, uh, just a touch later as people are leaving the castle. Similar to the robes, the neck accessories seem to have a nice variety. During the character creation screen, we see that you have choice of bow tie or necktie. Uh, here at 250, this girl who we will refer to as Scary Starry Slytherin uh, is wearing a ribbon around her neck. Uh, Natsai Onai has a slightly different tie here at 558, um, stripes versus no stripes, even though they're in the same house, which I think is a great idea. It gives you a little bit of variety. Uh, and then here at 539, uh, we see a pin in what is known as a flat scarf. Now, keep in mind, this is not a puff scarf. Those are longer and tucked into a vest. Though both can be fastened with a necktie pin or brooch. Now, some of you might be asking, well, doesn't that make it an ascot? Stop asking questions. This was the very start of that fad, which makes mysterious Minecraft homes here on the cutting edge of men's fashion. At 1239, we see um, a bunch of possible looks, two of which have school crests on them including this one, which we see earlier in potions class. Notice this one has a gold Gryffindor tie instead of a red Gryffindor tie. And we also have some non-uniform options. So at the start of the game at 5.06, Figs takes you to Green Guts, dressed as the food critic from Ratatouille. At 8.16, we see the same jacket on the chair as was in this screen. And at 10.50, we also get a look at a possible Slytherin in a non-school uniform. And just because I can't help myself here at 10.12, troll armor. That covers companions and uniforms. Now a couple of quick things about the professors. Theoretically, at least, this is all of the teachers assembled at the table in the main meal room. At uh, 2.32, we see a close-up of our charms professor. And if you notice, he has snakes on his chest, which makes me wonder if he's a Slytherin. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Still in the dining hall, we see the sorting hat lady, who turns out to be the one who shows you and Deke where the room of requirement is at 1109. 
Then there's the broom flight instructor. If you watch her at 434, as she's passing across the screen, if you look behind her, you'll see a dragon. And she's also the one who says the goal of today is to remind all of you how to maneuver on a broomstick safely, which is this shot here. Now, since we're talking about the broom instructor, let's go a little bit deeper into brooms. So, 434, this is the broom flight instructor, not a player. And yes, you do see the pitch, because of course there's a pitch, but what you don't see is any Quidditch. Here at 941, there are what I will call broom balloons. I believe that this is a mini game where you have to pop the balloons by flying through them. Uh, they appear in two different places, here and also here again when the broom teacher says the goal of today, yada yada. The only other broom I saw is basically this dude just parks his car right in his shop. Also worth noting is that his potion station is equipped with an alarm either to let him know when his potions are done or to shout no touching at passersby. And I just want to take a moment to talk about Quidditch. I find it impossible to believe that they are going to have a playable Quidditch game, mini game or otherwise, inside of this larger RPG game. Think about the extra resources that would be required to create basically a sports game within the RPG those resources would be much better spent on actually finishing the game. Much more likely is that any Quidditch stuff would be a cutscene. One way I believe you know for sure that there is no Quidditch in the game is that there is no broom flight category in the abilities menu. If there is no Quidditch matches, a much more interesting use of the Quidditch pitch would be a Triwizard Tournament and a Yule Ball. However, I could totally see a future DLC pack that introduces Quidditch in a year or so if the game is well received. To liven things up, here are some things that I noticed that most Harry Potter fans lost their minds about, but most non-Harry Potter fans missed. Here at 309, you see a Boggart box. You see the same Boggart box again at 810 with the second duel. At 816, there's a flying broom and a regular broom right next to each other. At 930, we confirm that there will be a pet cat, but possibly pet rabbits as well. At 944, this Niffler steals your brush. At 10.46, this is Peeves, people. Peeves is in the game. At 10.50, trifle desserts are confirmed. Trifle can be made from any jelly. I'm not sure why he refers to this fig specifically as a trifle fig, but whatever. Also, this is almost 40 years before the great trifle poisoning scandal of 1926, so we probably can eat trifle with impunity. And at the 11 minute mark, these instruments are playing themselves. Now, let's talk about locations. This is Hogwarts Legacy, after all. It is a vast open world game, but Hogwarts is everything. At the 1 minute and 20 second mark, we get a view of the bridge next to Hogwarts uh, here in the daytime. Also, earlier in the video at the 52 second mark, we get a look at the same bridge, but unfortunately that's at night. Then there's this shot at 1.15, which is a daytime shot of the Owlry. It's the reverse of the night shot from the night before. This is a better view of the Owlry, especially in relation to the Groundskeeper's Hut. And since we're talking about the Groundskeeper Hut, here at 428, that's probably the best look at that. At 139, we get a look at the courtyard, and as we're approaching the courtyard, you will see the Roman numeral 2. I don't know why that would be, or if that's part of the lore, but if anybody knows what that is, please comment below. Typing in Harry Potter 2 into Google does not get you what you want. 142, we see the same stained glass here as in 425, when we use the Accio spell to grab the page. 358 is the Prefect's bathroom, which I find interesting because there are exactly eight Prefects at any time in the school. Four boys and four girls. What the hell happens in this bathroom? One might wonder aloud during the Wife Wants a Wizard After Dark special. 439, this is not the Chamber of Secrets. Uh, the character walking through the room is a Gryffindor, and the room was sealed to all but Slytherin and Parcel Tongues. That Harry was able to open it was a miracle brought about by his connection to Voldemort. That Ron Weasley was able to open the chamber was evil Hollywood deus ex machina. During the announced trailer, uh, I noticed that there were table runners in the main dining hall. Those are gone at present, but I really hope they bring them back because they were cool. This is the 1012 mark. We're in a room with candelabra floor panels. What you'll notice is that this object right here moves out of the way and then never comes back. It's a very short clip. Um, it could theoretically be a jumping puzzle, but I think it's much more likely that we're in the Hogwarts clock tower. I think this is going to be a main quest because you can see the fast travel node right over there. Then finally, we get the room of requirement. There is clearly a skylight in the room, which I think is very odd. 
it would imply theoretically that the room of requirement is on one of the top floors. This is another shot of the same skylight at 1146. Right here, there is a question mark in this status HUD element, uh, meaning that the magical cleaver is chopping something into an ingredient, but we don't know yet what that ingredient will be. Uh, this smelter right here is making moonstone. You can see that it has literally the same icon that we spend here later at 1123. This is a wide shot of the room of requirement. We've been obsessing over the room where you can plop your house, but if you notice, there are two other alternate dimension places on the second level. Also, if you look very carefully, there's a passageway on that same second level that connects them. Uh, the room requirement has a house banner. Theoretically, if you were in another house, it would have another banner. At 11.23, the room requirement clearly requires you to do stuff, not necessarily the other way around. These instructions allow you to unlock additional potion stations. Um, also, each station appears to have four different skins, one for each house. For those of you who are concerned about the amount of time it takes for, say, plants to grow and that sort of stuff, users can use fertilizer to accelerate plant growth. Uh, it's made at this station here at 11.43. Since we're here, if you look in the background there, you can actually see there is a Slytherin table in a Gryffindor room, which means you can mix and match. Here at 11.28, apparently there's a way to pull a full-grown mandrake without ear protection, without it killing you, every 25 minutes. This table in the background here is probably doing your homework for you, so you can focus on not apparating around the open world. At 11.59, you'll notice that the housing limits are mostly about Moonstone. After whoever this is plops their cottage, you'll notice that the conjuration budget meter barely moves. And so that's basically everything that I saw inside of Hogwarts. Uh, next up is going to be Hogsmeade, or as the kids are calling it nowadays, the mall. So I believe that this meeting here is taking place at Hogsmeade, and I think I can prove it if you take a look at this stair-step architecture on this building back here. Here at the 12 minute and 20 second mark, we see this exact same building on a wider shot of Hogsmeade. This here at 603 is a better shot of Hogsmeade, uh, the buildings and the railing. Now, one thing that I would like to mention about this meeting that we're overhearing is that the second guy says, I just watched a student immediately after Ranrock says, you said you could get the student when they got to Hogsmeade. So not only is this clearly your first visit to Hogsmeade when all this goes down, but you must have thwarted their plan somehow, either a kidnapping attempt or these are the people at the mall who ask you to take a survey for 20 bucks. Then there's this moment, which should not be a shock given what we just saw taking place at Hogsmeade. This is at 1240, and it makes me think that the Riddler here is trying to recruit us rather than attack us openly. He is clearly the one in charge of the band of dark witches and wizards embroiled in the turmoil of the times that they talk about in the narration. Here at 1216, we get a real nice shot of Hogsmeade Station. At 1224, you notice there's a Hogsmeade manhole cover, which I think is kind of neat. At the 1240 mark, you can clearly see that Hogwarts is within visual distance of Hogsmeade, and based on the orientation, the bridge that we saw earlier, this is what's at the end of that path. Here at 1245, we get confirmation that Hogsmeade has an Ollivander's wand shop, uh, which should be of no surprise. And then finally, yes, at 1410, Butterbeer has been confirmed. And while we're finishing up with locations, there's a bunch of mystery locations that I want to run through real quick. Uh, 336, this is Ranrock's underground pipe room. Uh, 721, behind the guy about to get owned with his own sword are two interesting bits. There's this circular room on the left and that shrine. We talked about that earlier when we were talking about chess. I used Photoshop to alter this image slightly, hoping to give you a better look at what's going on back there. By the way, at the 1417 mark, you see this exact same attack where you take the sword and attack the guy with it, except the second time around, the sword is spinning as opposed to this time when it's being jammed in. 937, this is what I call the big top wedding tent scene. I believe that at 955, this is the possible above angle shot because of the location of the balloons. At 1028, this is the farm slash groundkeeper's hut. There is a gap in the trees in the background. Uh, that could be an entry into the Forbidden Forest, or it could just be a random nook. And then finally, I call this the Many Wizards Headquarters. You fight the Many Wizards, you fight them again. And then this is the front door, which I think contains a puzzle. 
Since we're talking about bad guys, here's something interesting I noticed. Ranrock's gloves. At 508, he has on a pair of iron gauntlets that appear to be able to stop magic and also allow him to cast magic, possibly like a wand. He enters with two guards and a Gringox accountant, but the accountant at his left leaves at some point, and it leaves just the guards. Here at 512, you can see that there's magic in his palm, and then he casts with his other hand. Then there's Ranrock's pauldrons. Basically, if you look at them from the side, they're a skull. This is the 137 mark. You can get a good look at the skulls. And then also here at 539. So I believe that Ranrock has a symbol. It's called a Celtic Trinity Knot or a Triquerta. It's a symbol of unbroken unity. Normally that's a good thing, except in this case you're going up against a cult, so it means you're probably going to get gibbed a lot. You can see it here at the 512 mark. Also at 339, it is on the other side of the moving platform puzzle that they showed earlier. Uh, you have to look pretty close at that railing. Uh, and then at 618, there is another Celtic symbol at the Reparo Ruins. And if you watch carefully, you'll notice multiple Celtic images and graphics uh, being incorporated into the world. So I think that's all going to be part of the lore. Then there are the banners. In looking at the Many Wizards headquarters, we see that they have their own banners, uh, which got me thinking about the other banners that might be out there in the world. At 122, we get the interior of Hogwarts. They have their own banner. Uh, 640, note the banner. It's blue on top and green on the bottom. 657, here's a better view. 659, here is the best view. 838, we get another shot of it. At 932, we get an extra faction. It is red and gold, kind of like Gryffindor, except it's not quite the same. And we really don't get a good look at it either, so we're not entirely sure who that would be. There is a Hogwarts banner in the Gryffindor common room. In the room with the candelabra, you can see the Hogwarts banner on the wall in the back. That's how we know it's on Hogwarts ground. And then at 1247, we see multiple evil green-blue banners. Just for fun, from the original announcement video, I'm throwing in these banners, which were the original Hogwarts banners in the main dining hall. And then last but not least, everybody has been talking about the red eyes. I think that that is dead on. Red eyes clearly indicate that an enemy has been possessed by some sort of dark magic. Uh, you have a connection to the dark magic, so you should be able to fix that, so on and so forth. Uh, at the one minute mark, we see it on the troll. At 2.50, I'm almost positive that Scary Stary Slytherin here is uh, possessed by something. She does not take her eyes off of you ever, and I mean for minutes. 5.21, we see red eyes in combat. 5.25, more of the same. At 13.35, these frogs have red eyes, which all wraps into the same thing. This is a magic that is infecting the world around it in a way that seems almost contagious. Now we're going to get into some of the more controversial subjects. First of all, magic. Illegal and or underage magic. Uh, at 5.06, at the start of the game, Figs takes you to Gringotts, and you have a wand in your hand, which originally made me think that this was before the rule that you couldn't do magic outside of school until the age of 17, except it isn't. I looked it up on the Harry Potter Wikipedia, and it says that the decree for the reasonable restriction of underage sorcery began in 1875. And we know from the newspaper that this is 1890. Now, if you're a fifth year, that's 11 plus 5 is 16. So this could mean a couple of things. Uh, this could mean that the game is more than one year long, okay, which would be super amazing. This could also mean that there is an exemption that if a senior wizard grants permission, then everything is okay. So the question becomes, how flexible is this permission? Because we see you by yourself later casting magic out in the world away from Hogwarts. And theoretically, that should be illegal. And the Ministry of Magic should know what you're doing. And if so, does that mean that you have to run back to Professor Fig with each mission to get his permission to nuke everyone in your path? All of this magic performed as a 16-year-old would theoretically be a violation, which makes me think that there could be a second year, which would get you 17 years old, or that the phrase, you're starting late, means you're a 17-year-old fifth year, uh, which then would make it okay. At 8.05, uh, we can see Professor Fig is there, so does that mean that he's supervising your use of magic? And if so, that probably means that that particular magic would be okay. And continuing our deep dive into illegal magic at 14.05 is the grand Avada Kedabra moment that everybody was so shocked about, except what most people don't know is that it is an unforgivable curse against witches and wizards. 
It has nothing, no bearing at all on anything else. And the target in that shock reveal is a goblin. So thus, the mora a morality system, if there is one, is not confirmed. That is a perfectly valid use of Avada Kedavra. I talked about AoE versus targeting at the start of the video, so now I want to talk about the spells themselves and what I noticed. Uh, spell combos. The phrase spell combos that the narrator uses does not seem to mean that you cast once and two spells come out or one spell flavored with another. I didn't see any evidence of that. Rather, it seems that you can cast spells so quickly that they react on the target in tandem or they flavor each other or whatever. That you see a couple of times. At 535, uh, the main character's basic attacks don't seem to have a cooldown. So I'm wondering if there's some sort of mana or stamina system that we can't see. There are blue globes in spots that look like they're full of mana. Um, I can't swear that that's what it is, but there are also globes in some spots that don't have anything in them at all. So that would seem to insinuate that those mana orbs have been drained. At 654, this section shows a user attacking with an offensive spell and then immediately switching to a defensive deflection while the offensive spell is still in the air. So that's what makes me think that this is going to be more along the lines of cast one and then cast another, and that is the combo that they're referring to. Also, this shows that the defensive spell can be upgraded to reflect damage back at the caster as opposed to in a random direction, which we see earlier. Uh, for comparison purposes, at 715, this is a non-reflect defendo, so it would be the weaker of the two. There also seems to be buffs and debuffs. At 657, the wizard on the right-hand side has a yellow indicator um, and is either buffed or debuffed. I couldn't tell which exactly. Um, at 733, however, on the edge of the screen, another enemy uh, has the buff or debuff state. Now, this could be an indication that it's a boss, though this looks like any other bowler hat wearing wizard. So I don't think that's the case. And then at 929, the wizard that you sap to the far side of the tree doesn't have any debuff aura when you first strike him with the wand spell, but then goes purple at the bottom, making me think that you debuffed him. Thus, I'm thinking that purple equals debuff and yellow equals buff. But that's just a guess. The other thing I noticed was some environmental destruction. It wasn't much, but the fact that it's there is really exciting. Um, other than the fact that the troll obliterates the house at the one minute mark, at 707, after a wizard casts Incendio, the main character deflects it back at them, but it misses. It hits some sort of piece of environment off screen, and then all of a sudden a bunch of pebbles and rock come flying in from that same side. Also at the 7 minute 58 minute mark is a second version of this. This is when the character throws out, we'll call it an ice frisbee, and that sends the goblin into the tree, and the tree shatters, sending the trunk falling. So in both cases, we're seeing a lot of environmental destruction that could affect, like that tree could possibly have landed on somebody. You know, We don't know exactly what happens there, uh, but very interesting. In terms of leveling, it is my opinion that the Descendo spell cast at 807 is significantly stronger than the others that we saw before it, making it possibly a leveled up version uh, that guy is so high in the air that the MC is able to fire his wand directly under the guy and hit the guy behind him. Here on this upgrade screen, I believe that those first two cards are wand magic and charisma. Also, if you notice, the stats add up to 15, but the user is level 12, which means we probably start the game at level 1 with 4 points to spend. Also, max level appears to be 47, which would be 50 in total if you add up all the numbers, minus the 3 that you start with. At 838, look at the distance that we're pulling this guy from. It is significantly longer than all of the other pulls that we've seen so far. So I'm guessing that this is a beefed up version of Aquio. At 855, I think it's interesting that the loom is the way that you access your traits, uh, which appear to be different than your talents, as seen earlier in the video. My question becomes, if traits applies to clothing, then why is there an upgrade function? In terms of defending yourself, this is going to be incredibly important. It should be the first thing that you level up. I think we can all recognize that. We see several examples of the user casting a magical deflect charm. However, this appears to also work as a backhand of sorts if somebody gets too physically close to you. 
We see the main character at 803 backhand a charging goblin. And at 1355, we see them also backhand a zombie. Now, let's talk about the Order of the Phoenix spell that is not Apparate. Uh, this is a standard movement spell. It is not Apparate. It's also not canon in the books. It was invented for the movies. We see it in the Harry Potter movies just prior to the death of Sirius Black, where Tonks and the other wizards in the Order of the Phoenix show up as the Death Eaters are trying to steal Harry's prophecy. I am very interested to see if Warner Brothers comes up with a name for this spell. We get a couple of great views of it, including the one here at 742. Uh, and then here at 1247, we see the evil wizard slash Death Eater version of it in black. And then one final note at 721... In both cases, stealing the sword with Experiamus caused a mini stun on the enemy. Um, I don't know if that's just built into Experiamos, and that's the reaction that somebody has when they lose their sword, or if there is a way to stack a mini stun on top of the spell so that you don't just take the sword. Uh, also, again, 1417, instead of jamming the sword in, it is spun into the guy's head. Proxy dispels this potion. Uh, at 918, this is what your face looks like when you drink a potion. So I assume you'll want to do this as infrequently as possible. Uh, at 1132, you can pick up a potion, which is identified as an invisibility potion in the room of requirement, which raises the question of whether or not this is how you stealth. Um, is there a stealth charm? And does your stealth ability level the potion, the charm, or both? At 1316, I also want to point out that this particular potion station runs on a purple flame, which makes me wonder why. Now let's get into some of the really good stuff, like weather. It should not have been a surprise that there are puddles on the ground after it rains, as this video is chock full of puddles. Here's a puddle, there's a puddle, 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 puddle. In addition to that, unfortunately, I didn't see much in the way of snow. That would have been really nice. Also, even though the game begins in September, right, which would have been the start of fall, I didn't see anything in, in the way of, like, leaves falling and that sort of stuff. Uh, that would have been interesting to see as well. But this is nice, and I'm glad they made the effort. From Puddles to Puzzles, starting from here, we're going to start getting into things that could be considered spoilers. Eventually, we're going to get to my prediction section, but right now, technically, I'm starting to give away some of the things of the game. I will warn you again before we get to the prediction section, in case you want to hang around for a little bit longer. But in this case, I am going to be revealing the location of some puzzle features and such, not how they're solved, but where you're going to find them. But if you want a pure experience, you should bow out now. Be sure to like and subscribe. Now, here is the 130 mark. There is a 3D map of the immediate area and or the full highlands here on the floor. I believe that this is a special room within Hogwarts that Professor Fig takes you to and the two of you operate out of. So think of it like a bat cave. By the way, I've heard people analyzing this video and they say that they think that the images on these portals are Hogwarts. I think that is wishful thinking without evidence. This is the clearest view that I could get of the portals themselves at the one minute and 32 mark and nothing here suggests Hogwarts or anything else for that matter. At 210, I believe there are other puzzles to be found in this video. For instance, this portrait frame in the Gryffindor common room has gold Roman numerals etched into it behind this discount Weasley. Now, you never get to see the full frame, so there's no way to solve the puzzle ahead of time, but it is there in case you were wondering. At 336, here is the sliding floor puzzle part of the Ragnarok pipe area. Again, you get a nice view of the Triquerta. At 348, here's the door knocker above the portrait, and what I'm thinking is that this is actually going to be a shortcut when you're inside the castle, that you'll actually be able to make it from one side to the other by activating the puzzle. So keep an eye out for any painting that has a door. 437, this could be tile, but it could also be a trap panel underneath of the devil snare in this hallway. 517, this is the vista for the sliding floor puzzle, which should be to your right. At 650, this device in the floor has particles coming out of it, making me think that it opens something else in the room. It's one of two, but the other one doesn't have particles, meaning that the main character already triggered the first one, but didn't get to the second one because they entered combat, or that you have to do them in some sort of order. Literally, a button with a question mark on it is embedded in the wall across the way at 1105. And then finally, at 1410, I believe that technically this counts as a puzzle, 
as the water level only rises as you get closer to the door. So I believe that your job will be to figure out how to get there without filling the room with what I'm sure is lethal magic. And now that brings us to a section which I will call, that's just odd. They're not bugs, they're not features, they're just odd. At 159, literally this is a student getting out of bed having slept in their robes. At 204, if you look to the right, you will notice that there is a skull mounted to the wall, a giant skull in the Slytherin common room. At 407, you can actually get a better look at it. And in addition to that, in the potions class, you can actually see two preserved heads mounted to the wall. At 205, the Gryffindor common room has two weird globes. One is an earth, not earth, who knows? What is, what is that? And then there's this blue thing. This is a better look at both items in the wide shot at 1011. At 203, when the main character is walking through the Ravenclaw common room, you can see something similar to this on one of the bookshelves. There is also a possible empty globe in the Charmed class at 247, and there's also a possible empty globe in the Transfigurification class at 402. Just in case you were so focused on the two characters who were having a conversation, if you look behind them at 211, you will actually see the knight in the background is moving. Uh, you'll find that the knights throughout the castle will move and do various things like genuflect to students. At 232, I think it is hysterically funny that someone Michelangelo'd this troll. Just after that, there's a bicycle on this chalkboard, and the idea that wizards who can do magic so powerful they can steal your sword then impale you with it might be obsessed with this newfangled thing called a bicycle is objectively hysterical. 328, there's a rhino skeleton underneath of the steps which I'm sure Indiana Jones would say belongs in a museum. Throughout the world, there will be magic books. I'm guessing that these are the books that give you various magic spells. Um, at the 208 mark in the Hufflepuff common room, you'll see a kid sitting on the floor and in front of the kid is a book that has lightning coming out of it. Uh, additionally, at eight minutes and 24 seconds, you can see that in the upgrade screen, as they scroll over the book, it switches to another graphic, and that graphic has particles coming out of a book. Um, and that particular card is the one that you know is leveling up your spells. So I'm guessing that all of the books that you find, if they have some sort of particle effect attached to them, then that explains that this is the book that you need in order to learn the spell. At 606, this is, in my opinion, the most beautiful shot in the reveal. So you would be forgiven if you didn't notice that there is a dragon on the beach down here. This wizard at 707 is living with zombies, making me think that he's a necromancer. Also, a bolt comes in from off the screen right, so thus there's two necromancers here. So my question becomes, can we become a necromancer given the possible dark path that was hinted at during the course of the video? This is something that I almost missed. Here at the 730 mark, you can actually see there's some yellow particles right here. If you watch that area, what you'll see is that there's a magic shovel digging something up on its own. And what I'm wondering is if that shovel belongs to the goblin who we're attacking, or if it's like our magic shovel that automatically finds loot. There isn't enough evidence, but I think that that would be a really cool feature. 842, what is with this horse portrait? Does this mean that those barrels are destructible or movable or it's part of some sort of puzzle? And is he some sort of famous horse? Why is he on the wall? And finally, uh, at 11 minutes and 21 seconds, in the entire video, 14 minutes long, there is exactly one owl, this one, and he's on the screen for less than a second at Hogsmeade. You can watch the video from end to end, one owl. Not even in the owlery at a school full of children. Even in the day-night cycle where there's a time lapse, it has no owls. And this is extremely odd because in the first announced trailer, there was almost exclusively owl. There were owls all over the place. And there's an owl on the box of the game. There are more seagulls in this video than there are owls. That is the definition of odd. All right, so now we're heading down the home stretch here. We're almost done. This is going to be my favorite portion of the video, the part where I reveal to you that I'm secretly a jerk by pointing out all of the mistakes, even though I don't hold it against them because the game is still in beta. This is what beta means. Earlier, I talked about how there was a building with no walls. There is more. So let's get right into it. 
147. The light from the stained glass on the floor of the dining hall does not match the windows that are behind it. In the very next scene, I'm not saying that I want nudity in the Hogwarts game. I'm asking for a little common sense. What kind of school forces children to have been in potions class all day, mixing who knows what together and stinking to high heaven, to then sleep fully clothed in their dress robes? Surely there are pajamas. Harry Potter had pajamas. I believe the pajamas are acceptable in the canon of the Harry Potter universe. And this kid should have some pajamas. This is the scene of 304. You gonna pay some attention there, lady. What if one of these kids conjures a snake? Not that there's anything wrong with snakes. I'm just saying you might want to be on the ball. 321, who designed these heat vents? This thing is hot enough to cook magic, and yet it vents directly into your crotch. These ovens are why there is a disproportionately diminutive number of witches and wizards in the world. You can also see them here at 916 in the room of requirement. At 327, we see that the lights are on during the day. Uh, also here, also there, also there. At 4 minutes and 28 seconds, if you watch this scene, the students literally pop in from out of nowhere. Also, at 12.14, when Not Harry is riding Not Buckbeak, this entire lake snaps in as he is approaching the horizon. As these two people are crossing each other at Hogsmeade at the 12.24 mark, the woman standing between them in the background disappears and then reappears. I have some issues with the logos. The Gryffindor logo is a lion on a red and yellow field, not a red and slightly less red field. Also, the Slytherin snake is backwards in multiple places. Same with the Badger logo, and the only proof that you need for that is to continue watching the video all the way until they start talking to the developers, and you'll see that those who identified with Hufflepuff have the Badger in the correct direction. At 8.10, the dragon skeleton is in the wrong place. When the students get hoisted into the air for the field, the dragon couldn't be where it normally would be because it would have interfered, one of them would have hit their head on the dragon, so they moved it to the left. However, when Sebastian and Discount Weasley are dueling each other, you can see that the skeleton has actually moved to a different location in order to make the skull drop possible. For what it's worth, this girl is staring at our character for the entire time. I mention it twice because it is super creepy. I mean, like, always. Also, the professor is not here when the deflection was going up towards the skull, and then at 8.15 she suddenly is. And then my question is, what is this student doing? Do you even T-pose, bro? Since we are already in the area, at 8.15, that is not how sundials work. At 8.20, that is not Deke. Why is that not Deke? You made me fall in love with Deke, and then you took him away. That's just not right. Also at 8.20, these talents improve your abilities in the room of requirement is the most redundant description in the history of gaming. Yes, we know. That's what it said in the title. Game devs, if the description is mostly words from the title, your skill tree is in trouble. Here's something else I noticed. There are no monarch butterflies in England. Monarchs are indigenous to the Americas and the South Pacific. And while humans in modern times have introduced them to Spain on accident, there are still to this day no monarch butterflies in the UK. Uh, they appear here in the greenhouse as well and also here at 918. These proclamations in the room of requirement, first of all, why would you put proclamations in the room of requirement? Who's going to see them? Only the person in the room of requirement. Also, they're the smallest proclamations in history. These are the 1890s equivalent of a tweet. At 9-11, this clock has no hands. In fact, I did not see hands on even a single clock in any of the video. So it's more like they're really boring posters. At 9-49, why does this ball have laces? Oblong balls have laces so that you can grip them for throwing. A round ball is spherical so that it can roll. There is no reason for there to be laces on just one axis. At 1046, I just want to go on record as saying it's a restricted section. Maybe just having a rope there isn't enough. I feel like mostly this is the librarian's fault. At 1146, the rumor requirement has a door. The rumor requirement also has a balcony. Why would either of those things be? At the 12 minute mark, after they build the cottage in the special cottage area, the moonstone cost decreases from 40 to 20. Also in the same area, what is that space alien looking thing? And why is there a light on this cat pen? It's not for the cat. Cats have fantastic night vision because of the mirrors in the backs of their eyes. And is there a nighttime in your personal house area? If so, why? And if the light is there for the humans so that they can visit their cat at night, dude, it's a cat. It's not there. It's out hunting mice and baby birds. 
Outdoor cats kill thousands of birds. They're not waiting around for you. Go get some sleep. 1316, if you watch the video, these pipes aren't attached to anything. They've escaped their parent model. And then finally, I'm going to cover two things that aren't bugs. Sectum Sempra was designed by Stape, not Rictus Sempra. And at the 830 mark, I'm sure Stealth without Harry's special robe is part of the special magic that even your professors don't understand and not some sort of flaw. All right, so here we go. This is the second and much more serious of the warnings. This is prediction time, and anyone who doesn't want to hear about the beginning of the game and how I think it starts should exit now. Be sure to like and subscribe. Prediction number one. No, there will be no Diagon Alley in the game. Diagon Alley, which is not an alley by any definition of the word, is in London. And given that this is an open world game, there is a 0% chance that they're going to take time to render an entire London so that you could do six minutes of shopping. Prediction number two. The Goblin Rebellion is a ruse. These two bickering lieutenants are not serious bad guys. I believe that this person from the original announcement reveal is the real bad guy. The guy's got a bone on his face. Theoretically, it could also be this chick who tunes up the bad guy in the original announcement reveal, but this is probably the bad guy. Prediction number three. The headmaster will be Dexter Fortescue. So Dexter Fortescue was headmaster from 1889 to 1892. And we know that the game takes place in 1890. This will not be Phineas Negulus Black, who was headmaster from 1913 to 1925, a full two decades later. Now, what is exciting about this is that we have no idea who Dexter Fortescue is, which gives Warner Brothers carte blanche to paint him however they see fit. In fact, he's the only headmaster on Fandom.com that doesn't have a portrait. The other part that's really exciting is that because Dexter dies in 1892, that means that he's either dying during this game or he's dying at the end of the sequel. Also, by process of elimination, this professor has to be Basil Fronsack, the next headmaster after Fortescue, except he has these snakes and Fronsack is a famous Ravenclaw. So take that with a grain of salt. This is Fortescue walking down the hall of the dining room. And we also saw him in the original trailer at the Sorting Hat ceremony. Because we know he only served as headmaster for three years, I believe the game will end with his death or serious injury, especially if the game is longer than a single year. Prediction number four. This texture on the wall at 124 is a puzzle map that requires Revelio. The question you have to ask yourself is, how do you have a mini-map in a building that has moving parts and secret passages? Using Revelio on walls and such would be one way to solve that issue. I believe that there's proof of this at 402, where you can see words etched into the wood of these back panels. Prediction number five. This trophy in the Ravenclaw common room is clearly something that is not part of that bookshelf. I'm calling it now. That's going to be interactable. Prediction number six. That is one of the flying papers that you have to collect. Prediction number seven. What I haven't heard anyone talk about are the six clothing options they showed us without crests. You can't wear them at school, right? So I'm thinking these are disguises used to infiltrate certain areas key to the plot. Prediction number eight. This bad guy from Hogsmeade is wearing a blue shirt and what I will call a green vest which matches the green-blue banners that we've been seeing in the battle sequences. Prediction number nine, at the 14 minute and 20 second mark, I believe that this is the door to the room of requirement. Prediction number 10, I did not see any jumping in the trailer, so I'm calling no jumping at launch, which is a shame because Neville had to jump to get enough power to kill Nagini, so we're not going to have any of that. Now, at this point, I have given you plenty of chances to exit. This is it. The moment where I ruin the start of Hogwarts Legacy for you. This is your last chance. Be sure to like and subscribe. Prediction number 11. At the 13 minute and 49 mark, the main character and Fig enter Gringotts, wearing the same clothes as they do in the confrontation. I believe that this is the start of the game, prior to landing at Hogwarts. I believe that Fig wants to test your magical abilities on a portal inside of Gringotts. But the portal is a fake, and you get caught by Ranrock, but manage to escape. 
I believe that your character sees something else in the vault that we don't see in the video, and that is why Ranrock later says to Rookstone, all you needed was a distraction to get the child. Now, it is possible that they're trying to recruit you to their side, but I think it's much more likely that they're trying to kidnap you to find out what you saw. Or possibly because you're the sole person who has the power to activate the portals. Now, in the original announcement trailer, there was a carriage that was flying through the air. I believe that you are palling around with Professor Fig until eventually he takes you to Hogwarts in his carriage. You'll notice that the carriage has the Hogwarts seal on the side. But one of the things to keep in mind is that everyone at Hogwarts, all of the other students, know you as, quote, the new student. Every year there are new students, so you must be getting there after everyone else has been sorted. The other thing to keep in mind is that when students arrive at Hogwarts, they do so on the ground in a carriage that is being pulled by Thestrals, not in one that is airborne, which makes me think that this is a special carriage that is either owned by the professor or by Hogwarts. Now, we touched on this earlier. During the announcement trailer, Fig was at your sorting ceremony. Now, apparently they've changed this, but I believe that the reason the sorting hat won't be able to place you is because of this mysterious connection that you have to the dark magic. And Fig is there to make sure that you get in one way or the other. Now, I really mean it now. This is it. If you thought the last one was going to destroy your world, this one will shatter you like an egg. Get out now because you're going to hear something that you can never unhear. Be sure to like and subscribe. The dreaded prediction number 12. You are a werewolf. Now, let me start off by saying that this claw mark scar, which we see in the character creation screen, uh, it could be anything. And so I'm not using it as proof. However, such a scar would easily fit in as an added accoutrement to a werewolf story. But beyond that, everything else fits. The last frame of the entire video in which the main character appears is him standing in front of a full moon. Why are we starting late and having a professor come to get us in a private carriage and take us to Hogwarts personally? Then the same professor attends the sorting ceremony after everyone else has been sorted. Fig needs a werewolf to access the secret scratch mark mirrors. Otherwise, he's a professor. He would just do it himself. It can't be done by a human. It must be a werewolf. I believe this explains why the user gets to choose which house they want to join for game purposes, because the sorting hat can sense the werewolfism and refuses to place you. I believe it's why we have a connection to forces our professors don't even understand. They're not werewolves. I believe this is why the logo squibble looks like it was drawn by a claw. I believe this is why you sleep with all your clothes on. Why walking up to a silver cup is such a challenge that every YouTuber who did a reaction video said, What? It's a cup, people. Why your best friend looks like a dog with mange. Why Warner Brothers didn't show us the first two upgrade options. Because the second one has a three-clawed wolf symbol in the background. Why this statue has wolf hands. Why you can stand in front of a 350-degree pile of iron and flame and not burn your legs. Why the teacher showed you a special room that gives you what you need, including possible anti-wolf potions, and a house where you can rock out with your fangs out without killing the other students. Why you make and then spend Moonstone? Why this is the face you make when you drink a potion meant for humans. Why you give out great belly scratches. Why you feel more comfortable in packs. Why Sebastian had to be reminded a second time about trifle figs not working on curses. Why you have this scratching post. Why your room of requirement requires a skylight because you needed to see the moon, you filthy animal. Why you're the only student in the history of Hogwarts to be allowed out at night. Why you're the only student in the history of Hogwarts to be allowed to stockpile food. Why the only fucking owl in the entire 14 minute reveal video flees before you, and I mean the second it sees you. Boom, mind blown. Well, that should be everything. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please like and subscribe so others can find us. I am working on some more videos for this channel while we're all counting the seconds until this game is out. This channel will eventually be us playing Hogwarts Legacy and we'll do tips and tricks and all kinds of stuff like that. Also, I'm working right now on a test to see if I could do some neat 3D stuff with the video that they've already given us. So stay tuned for that. Finally, and I bet you forgot about this, don't put children into dungeons. Even if you tell them it's a dorm, it's just going to turn them into perfectly normal people who talk to snakes every now and then, okay? Okay.
Nothing wrong with snakes. Thanks again for watching.